All right, uh, we can probably get started. Um, those of you guys that were here for the last two lectures, uh, vision transformers, um, and the one before that was on like attention, uh, how that's used in transformers, kind of. Uh, the first part may be like a little bit of an overview. Uh, so yeah, we can kind of get into it. Uh, the timeline for today is kind of to review CNNs, their motivation, what makes them good, what makes them bad, then the transformer. Um things that have been kind of uh, pushing forward the state of the art of computer vision. Uh, we're gonna first start off with like the NLP context, so like BERT, um, how those embeddings are kind of generated, what the purpose of that is, then move on to vision transformers, then compare vision transformers versus CNNs, and then the SWIN transformer, which is an improvement upon uh, vision transformers for kind of computer vision applications. So we're gonna kind of talk about window detention, patch merging, then shifted window attention, which is the, the big thing in SWIN transformers, uh, end with positional embeddings, and then kind of talk about overall findings. If we have time, we can talk about some advanced segmentation methods, uh, but yeah, that's gonna be kind of a cherry on top uh, if we get to that or not. Yeah, so starting off, uh, the tool suits the task. We want to choose the correct tool, the correct model, the correct network to use uh, to suit whatever task we have at hand. Um, so 
we talked about CNNs earlier. Um, they gained popularity about a decade ago. Um, the kernel goes over the image. A uh, certain stride length um, creates a convolution with uh, reduced dimensionality. Uh, the way the CNN works is it detects edges and general image contours, so general features in earlier layers. And as it continues, um, it kind of gets intuition for more specific features. Um, this is finally passed into an FC network, and you have a final output prediction. Uh, we spent a decent amount of time the last couple classes on this, um, kind of earlier on. So i uh, just going to skim through this. Um, something we didn't talk about too much is that CNNs have translational equivariance. Um, what this means is that they, they kind of adheres to what is called a 2D neighborhood structure. Um, so because we have a kernel, which is sliding along this image a certain stride distance, um, depending on where our kind of region of interest is in the image, uh, the CNN will capture this at different points uh, along its uh, stride movements. Right, so they respect locality. They won't start by comparing the two opposite edge of edges of an image. They'll start on one side, um, and as the kernel progresses, uh, as the stride continues, um, it'll learn more and more information. So CNNs are translation equivariant, like our eyes. This means that if something, if the region of interest changes position from one image to another, or undergoes some type of augmentation, either like a rotation, uh, an illumination, a size or a translation to different parts. Um, if I'm looking at somebody on the left side of the room versus the same person, if they move to the right side of the room, uh, my eyes act as a stride, right? So I'll see them if I'm scanning from left to right. Um, this applies to many augmentations. Um, and we'll see how this uh, kind of varies as we go into the transformer architecture as well. Um, so CNNs, yeah, the, the biggest takeaway is that they're translational equivariant, which means that as this image moves, um, our output is also translated. Right, um, which which makes sense, similar to how our eyes work. So something that's very interesting is that CNNs have shown a propensity for textural bias over shape. This is extremely interesting because it asserts that CNNs can still classify perfectly given a shape augmentation while texture is constant. Right. What this means is that if we augment the shape of a certain thing, uh, while we remain uh texture as as constant. Um, by applying textural filters to an image, um, by stylizing images, as it's called, um, their performance can uh, decrease or increase depending on our shape and texture bias that we are uh, applying to this. So this this bottom example shows this well, right? We have a texture image of an Indian elephant. Um, this is the kind of like skin of an Indian elephant. Um, then we have a content image, the tabby cat. and our, our network classifies this correctly. Um, and as you can see, all of the uh, kind of classes that it thinks are similar to this are all in that kind of like cat, fox, animal category, right? However, if we apply this texture to this image, we classify this as an Indian elephant. And our two other uh, classes that we've determined this could be are, are also corresponded to the texture. It doesn't see this shape at all. Um, this textural bias is uh, kind of Good in some ways, but it can be bad in others. Um, there's been a couple studies shown on this, um, but uh, yeah, I, I thought this was extremely interesting. If we take a stylized image and a content image, by applying this style to this content, this would misclassify different cities. You can misclassify different kind of uh, images as well. Um, so this is an interesting thing uh, that we want to keep in mind as we go into transformers. Um, so going into the context of transformers, uh, for NLP tasks, right? Um, we talked about this extensively when we were talking about attention. Um, last class, I believe, was vision transformers. Uh, but for NLP, transformers specialize in long-range dependencies, right? We talked about self-attention, a way to tie important things in a sentence together by performing attention within a sentence, uh, specifically focusing on the uh, priors that we have based on prior words that we encountered in a sentence. Um, attention lets us focus on certain parts of the input and self-attention, like we talked about, lets us do this within a sentence. So for example, full versus empty, just changing one word means that the reference for it changed. So these two sentences are identical, uh, except for the last word. So I poured the water from the bottle into the cup until it was full. In this case, it refers to the cup. I poured water from the bottle into the cup until it was empty. 
right? So in this case, it is referring referring to the bottle. So in order to capture these uh kind of trends over time, um, self attention lets us do this in a very methodical way. Um, and we kind of talked about this uh in the last two classes. We also talked about this calculating attention, right? We have a a query key value system where we have a query. We want to determine its similarity to different keys. We want to update our value priors based on that dot product, right? So we're multiplying the soft maxed Q times K dividing by the distance to kind of correspond to the size of these matrix multiplications. We want to account for this size so that this is standardized. Pass it through a soft max, scale our values by this, and our output is based on the magnitude of our values as corresponded to uh, the other values. Um, so essentially you can think of it as tuning the value weights um, by determining whether your, your query and your key um, are similar or different. So in a perfect world, you could have, if you really know what you're looking for, if you really know what you're doing, your key and your value could be the same value. Um, yeah, we, we talked about this extensively. Uh, we're going to be introducing a slight shift to this. So we're going to be introducing a bias term in the denominator for this, specifically for shifted window transformers. Uh, but now, right, we want to talk about something something new. Before we talk about how the tool suits the task, right, if we want to do some NLP stuff where we have a lot of text, we use a, uh, like a transformer. We can use like BERT to generate embeddings, um, use those to capture long range dependencies. For like very simple 2D image classification tasks, we want a CNN with a kernel, right? Now, what if we wanted to do something to handle both NLP tasks and vision tasks, or just like a general architecture that can handle both of these? That's where the transformer comes in, right? Um, we can use transformers um, for various tasks, specifically uh, vision transformers for computer vision tasks. Um, so yeah, this paper is extremely good. Um, an image is worth 16 by 16 words. This is talking about how uh, authors wanted to deviate very little from the classical NLP kind of BERT transformer architecture. So we still have 1D token inputs. We're flattening basically an image into patches of 16 by 16 pixels. And we're passing these as our embeddings through a linear layer, uh, which will generate our embeddings and then passing those embeddings into our transformer model. Um, the positional information now is learned by the model. We don't have a positional embedding that we're passing in. Uh, we talked about this during the uh, attention lecture, how we can use uh, sine, cosine, different metrics to figure out positionality of different words in our sentence. Um, but that is something that a transformer uh, is able to automatically figure out. Um, this is going to relate to the bias term that we're going to talk about when we go into the shifted window transformer. Um, essentially, this output, once we kind of tokenize this picture into a... Uh, a, an embedding is a classification head, multilayer perceptron to finally predict class. Um, attention also matters uh, in this uh, kind of vision transformer architecture as shown on the right. Um, this is straight from the paper where you can see we have an input here. We have attention focusing on the subject. Again, we have an input attention focusing on the subject. Here we have a lot of things going on. This is a misclassification. So as you can see, we don't really have attention on a one specific kind of uh, target. So it's like Exactly, exactly. You can think of it exactly like that. Um, so we're saying that an image is worth a 16 by 16 uh, kind of subset that we're flattening, making a 1D embedding out of and and sliding that through our, our transformer model. So we're basically just kind of like shifting uh, the information that we have, but we're keeping the transformer architecture the same. So we're able to apply this to uh, kind of a, a computer vision task. So yeah, now let's talk about vision transformers versus CNNs. So vision transformer self-attention layers are global, right? So this is global to the entire image. Only the MLP will compare neighboring pixels. So the last layer, the multi-layer perceptron. Also to a transformer, an embedding is an embedding. It doesn't matter if it's an image or a word. It's just quite literally a vector and whose dimensionality kind of captures different information about its input. Um, so it doesn't care whether this is an image or a word. The transformer architecture will stay the same. This kind of ties back into the last thing that we were talking about in terms of one tool that suits multiple tasks, right? Can we come up with something that is generalizable? Can we come up with something that is, instead of being super specialized, something that can handle a whole bunch of inputs? 
Um, this also reduces inductive bias in a model compared to CNNs. Um, so inductive bias is kind of assumptions that our model is making. Um, and we want to reduce this in order for a certain model to be generalizable. Uh, and this further ties into generalizing assumptions based off of training data into a model of a specific domain. So for example, uh, for our NLP model that we talked about um, a couple of lectures ago, um, if we are assuming certain priors for that, those are not going to apply to when we try to apply the same transformer architecture to a computer vision task, right? So uh, for those of you that have heard of Occam's razor as well, if two models are explaining training data equally well, the simpler model is preferred as a generalization, right? We want a model that doesn't assume priors about our knowledge or about our data and instead can be generalized to multiple tasks. This kind of also ties into, if we're talking about like the grand scope of artificial intelligence, of which this decal is like a very, very small subset of, um, people at like Facebook AI research, um, Yan Lacoon, right? They're trying to push forward um, like artificial general intelligence. So some kind of thing that uh, like captures general intelligence uh, as we know it. Um, and in that kind of vein of thought, um, having generalizable models is uh, a very good thing. On smaller data sets, however, uh, it could be inferred uh, and it data shows that CNNs outperform transformers. Transformers really shine when a lot of data is present, right? If we have a very small task, there's no reason why we would need a very complicated, very uh, processing heavy transformer architecture. If we have a small like, uh, like 128 by 128 pixel image, um, a CNN should be able to perform just fine for that, especially if we're just trying to figure out like the gist of an image. Um, however, we talked about this uh, during our attention lecture as well. If we have like a whole book that we want to sort through, a transformer using attention allows us to really speed up this processing. We don't need to constantly like go through the entire uh, kind of subset of our, our universe of text. Um, we can focus on specific things during this process. So on smaller data sets, CNNs outperform transformers. This makes sense. Um, but the assertion is that BITs model human eyesight more than CNNs, right? They prioritize shape by default. So while we talked about uh, earlier, right, we talked about that CNNs will prioritize texture. Um, going back to the tabby cat example, this is very clearly not an elephant. This is a tabby cat with a an elephant's textural uh, kind of component laid on top of it. Um, and a CNN will misclassify that. However, VITs will model human eyesight better because of this reduced inductive bias, right? Now they're prioritizing shape over texture. Um, this is a, a strong benefit of, of vision transformer models. And most of the kind of computer vision applications as we further technology are becoming more and more complicated. This is where kind of transformers shine. Yeah. Uh, what about the CNN architecture? Like, uh, how does that identify? Uh, right, right. So because we have a stride that stays the same shape and the same, uh, or our stride stays the same as we pass along an image and our kernel stays the same size, um, we're learning things about the image very generally as we kind of go across an image. So we're not we're not gaining new information about how like one patch will relate to another patch, right? Because we're we're just moving a single stride and a single fixed kernel size across our image. So that's where like the bias comes into play. If we're able to generalize multiple parts of the image, like having like global self-attention, uh like vision transformers do, this will reduce our 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 bias. Yeah. So this is like global exactly yeah that's why like on a first pass of cnn like you're gonna get really general features only once you like make multiple passes you start um like combining or you run through like multiple deep cnn layers are you gonna like actually start learning uh higher order features yeah all right so uh a very interesting field is uh adversarial attacks so adversarial robustness um, and this is kind of a third metric that I don't believe we've talked about before, but we're going to be introducing in this lecture, uh, is, uh, being able to distort an image, uh, kind of, uh, by introducing noise into it so that certain classifiers are no longer able to classify these images because of the noise we've introduced, but visually these are, uh, unob unimpaired or unobstructed. Um, this is actually, uh, relating to a project, uh, that I did as part of MLab. Uh, my first semester, uh, this was uh, kind of looking at the Carlini-Wagner attack, who was a Berkeley graduate, 
uh, who's currently working at Google Brain, who released kind of a his own method for adversarial attacks, the Carlini Wagner attack. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting literature in this field. Uh, but because uh, they prioritize shape over textural bias, vision transformers seem naturally robust to visual distortions. So for example, we have like a little panda here. We introduce some noise, um, and now our classifier is really confident that this is a given, even though it's visually like we can very clearly see it's a panda but by, by introducing targeted noise into an image we can uh we can kind of change the entire classification uh this ties into this as well right if we have like a slight augmentation right the left side pretty clearly looks like a cat like a cat with like a little pointed ears if we make the nose a little more defined now it's looking a lot like a dog right so just by changing a couple pixels our entire classifier even our human eyes can't really tell what's up, right? Um, so there's a lot of factors that factor into decision-making in natural scenarios. So self-driving cars in a storm aren't super reliable, right? Their sensor suites have noise introduced to them. Um, and you don't want to misclassify stuff, right? You don't want to misclassify a, uh, like a, like stop sign as like a person or something like that could have really bad implications. But even the human eye isn't infallible. Like personally, like the left one really looks like a cat to me and the right one, definitely looks like a, a dog. So uh, these are very, very small changes in lighting, pixels, things like that. Uh, vision transformer limitations, however, show then other fields of uh, CV. Uh, so in this case, like image restoration, semantic segmentation, where patches are passed in and processed one at a time. So border information can be lost, right? We're kind of focusing on the main, we're putting our attention on the main source uh, of information, the main subject. Um, so fine grain pixel analysis within a patch also is weak. So essentially, if we take, if we take like a a certain like image and we break this into like certain patches, we only have information. Now we're treating each one of these patches as its own data point. So anything within this patch, any information within this patch, we're treating as like the same. So like th these are all the same. This is all the same. This is all the same. This is all the same. So if we wanted to do something where we need like really fine grained pixel analysis within a patch, we're not able to do that, right? Um, so that's that's kind of where uh like both CNNs and vision transformers are a little weaker. Um but yeah, uh in terms of adversarial robustness, um, because like VITs are learning as humans learn by prioritizing shape over texture, um, they seem to be naturally robust to vision distortions, but there has to be a lot more uh, kind of experimentation done on this. Uh, yeah, because you can think of this noise, this noise filter that's being applied as essentially a uh, a textural bias that you're applying to this, this image. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that's why it's, it's misclassifying. Uh, however, ideally vision transformers won't have this problem. All right, so uh, Bit isn't always lit. There are problems with vision transformers. Uh, the problem is, uh, let's let's look at the original kind of vision transformer architecture, right? We're breaking an image into 16 by 16 pixel patches to create patch vectors with a linear projection. Uh, we're passing these through, combining them with positional embeddings and passing this into a transformer, right? This is like a very, very simple, this is how our transformer architecture works. Right, we have a regular transformer architecture. Afterwards, we can black box that for now. Lastly, we pass it through a classification head to give us kind of our final prediction. Is this a bird, a balloon, a blue sky? In this case, you know, it could be a little bit of everything. Um, but we're again, we're breaking the image into these sixteen by sixteen patches. Uh, this generates right sixteen image tokens as we we break it down, given the size of you know our image, depending on how we break this down. Um, where each image, uh, each 16 by 16 patch contains 256 pixels. Um, but the extraction of patches is a problem specific to image, not text, right? In text, we're not really like breaking up our uh, thing by, by patches. We're just kind of passing in these words or sentences as embeddings. For bigger images, the number of image tokens will grow extremely quickly, which is okay for bigger GPUs or if our task only re requires the precision of 16 by 16 uh patches right so for image classification we want to predict one label for the entire image so you want to take in this image on the left and say oh this is a balloon right so we're trying to like yeah if this is our image we're trying to say okay the subject of this image is a balloon 
However, for tasks like semantic segmentation, we want to classify each pixel, right? We had a lecture about this earlier. We want to say, okay, these pixels are people. This outline is a balloon and the rest is a sky, right? So we actually want to classify each, each kind of sub pixel. But if we're doing this thing where we're taking 16 by 16 patches, uh, we can't really do that, right? Because we're treating this entire kind of uh, input as its own self-contained uh, like data point. So we don't actually have information about what's going on in this. We're just kind of like combining it into one, oops. We're just kind of combining this into one uh, data point. And this will grow exponentially, right? If a 16 by 16 patch is too big for certain tasks, obviously we just, instead of 16 by 16 patches, just use every pixel as its own patch, right? And pass that into a transformer. However, this will grow extremely quickly, right? On like an N squared scale, right? Because as we go from like a regular 128 by 128 images to much bigger images, 1920 by 1080, uh, now we have 2 million tokens. Now, if we are passing in a 4K image, 3840 by 2160, we have 8 million plus tokens. Um, and these are extremely long sequence lengths to be passed into a transformer requires a lot of processing power uh, and it's just not very fun for us as consumers of transformers, right? Um, so these are problems with the typical vision transformer. How can we fix this? Shifted windows begin to swim. Um, yeah, that was a pretty bad pun. Uh, but essentially the shifted window transformer was introduced in mid 2021. So not too long ago where they proposed a method to alleviate problems with vision transformers using non-overlapping windows to perform self-attention within groups, then smartly combine these groups, uh, these windows together, and then perform attention within these. So essentially you start off with like really fine kind of, not quite pixel by pixel uh, things, but really small groups. Then you combine these, these tiny groups called patches into windows. You perform attention within these windows and then you combine these windows together and then form, perform cross attention. So now you're performing attention within two things that previously were not uh, attended to, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, so using the shifted windowing scheme allows for cross window attention connections. Um, a way to show this, I broke this chart, so I was not confused with that. But if we had this image, which we're gonna come back to later, um, but if we had this image as uh, 224, by 224 pixels, right? We want each of these patches to be, uh, uh, sorry, we want each patch to be four pixels by four pixels, right? This is kind of like a classic for the swing transformer. So we have a lot more granularity than our previous uh, previous uh, model, our vision transformer model, right? So we have four by four pixel patches, right? We wanna combine this. So each, each of these patches is one of these. So we're defining now a window of 49 uh, kind of patches, seven by seven. And then we have eight by eight of these windows to get to our kind of 24 uh, or 224 by 224 model, right? So we have uh, these seven by seven uh, uh, kind of amalgamation of patches, which forms one window. And we have eight by eight kind of sections that we have in here. Uh, that is kind of like the, the big motivation for this. So essentially we have our image here, right? We have, uh, these, these patches that we're making of pixels. Now we have these big, uh, kind of four by four, uh, sections of patches that we call windows. And then we're shifting these on top of each other to classify. That is kind of the, uh, overarching goal of this. And we're going to kind of get dive into the details of this in a bit. Um, but because we are developing a hierarchical feature map that yields um, an improved global representation of the model, um, we now know that because we're doing cross attention, we're prioritizing certain features over other features, right? Um, that's kind of like an inherent benefit of, of this model, which allows us to develop a better understanding of what this global representation is of our image. Uh, the second benefit of this is that now, instead of n squared uh, computational complexity increase with respect to image size, we now have a linear computational complexity because we're keeping the size of our patches the same, right? The only thing that we're doing is we're combining the windows. Um, so we'll, instead of having n squared complexity, where n is the number of vectors that we're passing in, now we have m by n, 
where m is uh the number of window uh number of like patches that we have um and this is going to be explained further as well um but yeah this is an example of image segmentation a lot of like self driving companies uh, and technologies use this i think it's a very very cool field i think ryan did a kind of a presentation on this earlier and yeah this flexibility allows the swing transformer to really excel at image classification object detection semantic segmentation we're going to walk through a full example of a swing transformer um to kind of talk about the motivation behind it as well as uh give like a, a very solid example so this is a swing transformer Swin large patch four window seven two two four twenty two k to one k. That is a very big name, uh. But essentially, uh, we're gonna break this down. Uh, the motivation behind the Swin transformer also is that we start with smaller patches and then we merge them into bigger patches in later stages, right? So by combining our windows, um, uh, a Swin tiny model. There's two types of models. Swin tiny has C equal to ninety six, so a capacity of ninety six. Swin large has a capacity of one ninety two. C is the capacity of the model, where C is the size of the embeddings when the image patches are initially converted into a 1D token. Um, you can also think about this as the number of hidden connections we need in our feed-forward neural network. So the amount of information, essentially, that we're capturing. You guys might have, uh, when we were talking about the BERT model, BERT has a capacity of uh, 768. Right, so this that's the length of your uh embedding, the dimensionality of that. Right, um, two twenty four here represents the image size. Um, we have three channels because this is an RGB image, so our input image size is two twenty four by two twenty four by three. Patch four means that the image is broken into four by four pixels. Uh, but each of these four by four size uh patches um actually is its own image, right? Because we're literally just cutting this image up. So this also has a three channel uh. Kind of component so each patch has 48 feature dimensionality including the rgb colors these then undergo a linear transformation converting them to a c-dimensional vector um so in this case because we're using swin large model these are going to be converted into a 192 uh size vector um and we know from previous uh classes that linear transformations allow us to take like a three-dimensional thing and convert them into like a C by one uh, dimensional like vector or a uh, one by C dimensional vector, I guess, in this case. Window seven, this means that we're partitioning the image into a non-overlapping way where M equals seven. So we have eight by eight non-overlapping windows total, right? Where each we have uh, 40, 49 patches per window. So we have eight by eight windows, right? So 64 windows where each window has 49 patches, if that makes sense. Uh, and each patch is a four by four by three image. Um, the math works out on this. 64 times 49 is equal to uh, 3136 patches. Um, and this is the same as if we just are breaking the 224 by 224 image into four by four patches. So 224 divided by four squared, right? Um, the last thing is uh, 22K to 1K. Uh, this just means that the model is trained on ImageNet 22K, um, which is like the number of class labels it has, and then fine-tuned on ImageNet 1K, right? Um, so hopefully, yeah, this gives you like an idea, not only of what this like super long title means, but also the significance of each of these things. Um, and kind of putting this in perspective is honestly like one of the most important parts of understanding the uh, Swin Transformer architecture. Okay, so the architecture overview. Um, you guys might be familiar with uh kind of the transformer architecture by now. It's kind of been the focus of our last three classes. Um, but essentially now there are two parts to the SWIN architecture. On the left we have window, uh, kind of uh multi uh attention, and on the right we have shifted window uh attention. Uh, we're gonna start by kind of going over regular window detention, uh WMSA. Uh, and then we're going to move on to shifted window. Um, we have a multi-layer multi perceptron at the end uh, with an input and output layer with some amount of hidden layers in between. And this uses a JELU activation function, right? So we know that RELU is a rectified linear activation function, right? Kind of looks something like, right, like this. Wow, that's sweet. Uh, yeah, it kind of looks something like this. Um, however, JELU is a Gaussian uh activation function. Uh, an interesting fact actually is that uh, Jelu was developed by a uh, a student, a PhD student, I think, at Berkeley, uh, Dan Hendricks. Um, so yeah, super cool things coming out of Berkeley. And Jelu is like pretty much like the status 
quo for like any uh kind of transformer architecture these days. So that is very, very cool. It's been cited in a bunch of different papers. Um, but yeah, before uh passing into our MLP, we pass uh the output of our windowed MSA into our layer norm, which normalizes the distributions of intermediate layers. Um, this enables smoother gradients, faster training, and better generalization accuracy, right? Um, to kind of put this into perspective, if we have like, okay, I'm really bad at drawing this stuff, but like you have like a really complicated, this is like a three-dimensional surface. And this is the surface you're trying to like minimize on, right? This is like a pretty bumpy surface. It has like a bunch of bumps like here and there. What layer norm does is it essentially applies like a smoothing operation to try to smooth this so that when you're calculating your gradient, the process is a lot smoother. Um, so it's smoothing out your gradient surface, yeah. Uh, does it smooth it like a way that's like really different than the batch norm does? Uh, so yeah, this does like, uh, we kind of compared, I think, batch norm to layer norm in the last one. Uh, but this, this speci specifically focuses on like intermediary layers, whereas batch norm will take like an entire batch, um, after one like kind of iteration of training and then smooth it out. Um, so layer norm is between these two steps. Batch norm would be like somewhere after, if that makes sense. So it's like a different, different, uh, part of the process. Um, but yeah, we, we've talked about MLPs before, so, uh, onto what windowed MSA is, right? Um, this stands for windowed multi-head self-attention blocks, um, and this is performed within each window, right? So we have eight by eight windows. Now within this window, we're performing WMSA. And the way this works is M is the number of windows the attention spans. So instead of calculating attention across all of our windows, um, and we might have, you know, like, this is one token, this is another token, this is another token, right? We'll have, like, a bunch of these kind of token embeddings. Instead of calculating self-attention across all of them, we only want to calculate it across a certain M value. Uh, in this case, M is two, right? N here is the number of patch vectors, and the process results in N vectors. So, yeah. Uh... We know that in our example, given that this is our example, um, we're taking 49 by 49 because we have two of these windows, right? Each of these with 49 patches. We're computing self-attention, cross-attention within both of these 49 uh, by four uh, patches. So the total number of DAW products that we're computing is 49 times 49. Um, and since the number of patches, however, in each window is fixed, we know the number of patches in each window is guaranteed to be 49 and that's not changing. Complexity will become uh, kind of proportionate to uh, image size, uh, or sorry, sorry, complexity will become linear to image size and not quadratic as it is for VIT. Because as we increase image size for VIT, we're, we're recomputing uh, each dot product across uh, the size, I guess, that we're adding. If you can imagine increasing image size is like adding a border around the image, we have to compute cross attention between each uh, kind of part of the image that we're multiplying against. Um, in this case, however, uh, as n increases, or sorry, as m increases, right, uh, kind of the n here will stay the same because we're keeping the number of uh, patch vectors the same. Uh, at the end of this, stage one is done. Uh, and we can move on to stage two, which is shifted, shifted window uh, multi-head self-attention. Uh, this is... Uh, going to be kind of a more clever way. This is the purpose of the paper. If you guys do want to check out the paper, uh, we can post a link for the ed afterwards. Um, but yeah, uh, now uh, this is an uh, author's example of how the patch merging process works. So we know how windowed attention works, right? You're literally just taking the uh, the dot products between two different patch, uh, patch windows, right? Um, we're going to use an author's simpler example for uh, kind of understanding how patch merging works. So if you have M equals four windows, right, and you have a small image that can be broken into eight by eight patches. So this is total eight by eight patches. We're breaking into four, window, uh, four windows with 16 uh, patches per window, so 64 total patches. Each of these has a four by four patch. Once the tension is finished, stage two begins. And the first thing we want to do is undergo a merging process where we want to concatenate the features of each group of two by two neighboring pixels. So each little two by two block, we want to concatenate into one uh, kind of uh, one like window, one smaller window. 
Uh, this creates new patch borders and remakes windows. Um, so to kind of put this into perspective, um, this is our original image, right? Eight by eight. This is one window. The first step is advancing each patch border by two pixels, right? So the top left patch border is, is shown here. And we wanna do this for each of the four patches, right? So for this, for this patch over here, this previous patch, we advance this by two pixels on each side. And this is done for each of these four windows, right? By advancing the, the patches. Now, right, we wanna take these new intersections with our image and use those as our new patch borders. So this results now in nine windows, three on each kind of level. But Swin has a solution to address this increase from four windows to nine windows. And its solution is to like cleverly combine these windows together. Uh, and the way it does this is uh, shown on the next slide. Uh, but before going into that, I do want to show that this is our initial kind of breakdown of windows after we do our little like padding, pseudo padding and remake our windows. Now we have nine windows, right? And keep in mind, a window is the kind of modem under which we perform self-attention. So self-attention will be performed within each of these windows, right? So keep that in mind. Each one of these uh, kind of smaller subsets is its own patch. Okay, so keeping the edges of the new windows that intersect the image, right? Um, we know that uh, we're going to be kind of introducing the entire size because we're introducing, we're uh, increasing dimensions by two on each side. We're gonna be increasing the total dimensions to four C, um, but, Something we want to keep in mind, this is where we left off uh, on the last slide. The way that we're combining these into a smaller amount of uh, patches is by combining our two by two patches. So each of these two by two patches into one patch. So now in the shifted window phase, we're resizing our patches by combining these uh, features. This reduces the number of patches from eight by eight that we had before eight by eight to now four by four, right? This reduces the number of uh, kind of total elements that we have from 64 total elements to 16 total elements. So we're actually reducing our dimensionality by a factor of four, right? However, because we're reducing each component, right? Height, height and width uh, by this certain factor of two, we also want to scale our depth or like our C dimension by two. So essentially we're reducing the number of patches to one fourth of the original, but we're doubling the size of the embedding size during this patch merging stage, right? So while we're reducing the breakdown of our, our patches, we're shifting, sorry, we're shifting the actual boundaries that we're using for each of these patches. We're keeping the embedding size and doubling it so that the total number of features that we have, we're not actually losing information. We're just reducing dimensionality while keeping the total amount of information that we have consistent. Um, I'm gonna also uh, kind of pull up the paper that corresponds to this so you guys can, can see an example later. Um, but this is kind of the most important part of the Swin Transformer architecture. You're performing a two by two merging of patches. So each of these patches is a four by four uh, pixel image. Now you're merging these. And by doing that, you're reducing the dimensionality, but you're increasing the, uh, the C kind of value, your uh, kind of other dimension by running this through a linear layer, right? So we know that linear layers allow us to change certain dimensions depending on their structure. And we're using that property to, uh, in like a kind of creative way. All right, so the next thing to talk about is optimization post patch merging. So this optimization technique doesn't use padding, but instead rearranges blocks to only have four windows. So. You can think of this as this, right? So we're increasing our boundary by two on each side, right? Essentially shifting this down, shifting all of our windows down by two, right? If they start off on the top left, right? But now if this was our entire image and these were our four windows, when we do this shift, we're left with a like two, two by whatever this is, a length of two kind of border around our image. The naive solution for this would be to zero pad this, 
right, at, before performing our attention. But the authors of this paper came up with a very creative solution, which is rearranging these blocks to provide savings and compute power. So once we do this shift, if we have an image or a kind of a section A, C, and B, by doing something called a cyclic shift, where we move C to here, A to here, and B to here. So moving like across the image to now calculate attention within this entire thing. So we don't have to recompute this, uh, this kind of uh, area of information. So essentially we're taking this image, we're performing a cyclic shift to move it to this part. We're calculating attention and then moving it back marking that this has already been calculated, which pro provides savings and compute power. So instead of having to do an entirely new operation to get whatever values for this, we're, we're shifting, then calculating attention like normal. So keeping like our time complexity constant, then moving this back. This is a very smart thing. And this is an optimization that the authors propose. The last thing we're gonna kind of talk about, uh, not quite last thing, but is positional embeddings, right? where we learn patch position information instead of it being provided. So in vision transformers, we provided like a sine, cosine, some metric of um, positional uh, information. And we included that into our embedding. In this case, I talked about adding a bias term at the bottom, right? Where before we knew we take our query, we take the kind of like dot product with the key, uh, the keys that we have, um, we softmax all of that. Well, first we divide those by the distance um, and then we we softmax the whole thing and multiply by our value to kind of perform an informed search, right? Now we're adding a bias term to the bottom. What can that do? Within an M by M patch window, assuming that this is our patch window, we have like, you know, certain dimensions of this, uh, seven by seven patch window, a patch can be at most six patches away from another patch, plus or minus six, if we assume like a constant scale, right? Essentially what this is saying is that I started this patch, right? Where can I look for other patches along this row? I can look at like plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six, right? If I was here, it would be minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, minus six. And for each of these movements, we have a zero. So if I don't want to move, then it's zero, right? So for performing this cross attention calculation, um, do I really have to look at Kind of every single possible pixel that I could use? No, right? Because I'm only performing attention within this patch. So this is now including a bias vector of 13 by 13 components, where I have my plus or minus six in this direction, plus or minus six in this direction. The Basically, this is encapsulating the possible kind of places upon which I can calculate self-attention. So by including this bias term at in uh, our attention calculation and by creating a smaller matrix of 13 by 13 dimension. So in this case, because it's seven by seven, there's plus, plus six or minus six directions that I can go to, plus of course the zero. So that's 13 in both directions. So that's the 13 by 13 uh, possible directions I can go to. So essentially I'm limiting the scope of the attention I can calculate, which is all right. In fact, it's preferable because I wanna calculate self-attention. Um, hopefully this makes sense. Um, kind of explaining how positional embedding can be done smart. So these are a lot of optimizations that the authors thought about, um, which are, are quite quite very uh, clever. Um, are there any questions kind of about this or the kind of last couple slides? Sorry, this is a lot of information. Yeah. Um, I that's a really good question. Yeah, so the channel size is uh is still there. When we're uh calculating our uh attention, right? This this is actually this four by four by three is actually a forty eight dimension feature vector because of the channels. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it will. Uh, yeah. What is changing is uh kind of the information contained in this. So as we combine these, now the channel size will change, right? We'll be doubling it potentially, or like having it depending on the linear transformation that we're applying to. So very similar to what we talked about with uh like CNNs and advanced architectures uh, on that front.
Okay. This is uh kind of where the math comes into play, uh, which is a little confusing, but this is the combination of patches, uh, and then finally kind of landing into a prediction. So if we have seven by seven windows and eight by eight, uh seven by seven patches per window and eight by eight windows, uh currently encoded in C equals 192 because this is a swin large model, uh, then we have you know. 3,136 patches. We do the merging process where we reduce the number of patches by one fourth. Um, we talked about this earlier, right? We went from 64 to 16 patches when we reduced dimensionality from eight by eight to four by four. Um, kind of drawing this out really quickly. We have eight by eight, but now we are making this into four by four and combining this, 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 this right, et cetera, et cetera. So, we're reducing that dimensionality. Um, so we're having each dimension, which now results in 784 patches. We doubled the encoding size though, right? Through our linear embedding. So we're doing two times 192 to get 384 encodings, even though we have 784 patches. Now our dimensions are height divided by eight times width divided by eight and 2C. That is the end of stage two. In stage three and four, Sorry, we're kind of doing the same thing. We're once again having the dimensions. So we get height divided by 16, width divided by 16, then height divided by 32, width divided by 32, right? And every time we do this stage, we're doubling the information that we're containing in our encodings to keep this constant, right? So now we're going from 2C to 4C, then to 8C. After stage four, we have 224, which was our original. Originally, we had it divided by four. After stage two, three, and four, now we're doing 224 divided by 32, which results in seven by seven tokens. And an embedding size now of 19, uh, 192 times two, times two times two, right? So that represents stage two, three, and four to get seven by seven tokens and 1536 dimensions. M now equals seven by seven tokens. So when we get an M equal to our patch size, right? Uh, or our window size, will we have the same amount of uh, tokens as patches in a single window? We know we finished the process, right? Uh, this makes sense because now, We've broken up this image essentially into like a representation equivalent to our initial kind of patch breakdown. The last component is an average pooling layer, right? So taking these certain components, pooling them together and finding the average of each uh, subset and a norm uh, to get a single representation with 1,536 embeddings. Lastly, we have a classification head to convert this embedding to the right class. So the MLP classification head at the end is kind of what gives our final prediction. Okay, taking a step back. Swin transformers manipulate windows so that attention is performed on certain subsets, but cross attention happens between regions as windows are combined and moved and shifted. This begs the question, are we hurting some of the things that make transformers what they are, right? Are we reintroducing inductive bias by kind of making these similar to CNNs in that now we have what is essentially like not quite a sliding window, um, but now we have shifted windows, which is, you know, kind of the same thing. Uh, are we reintroducing this inductive bias as we're doing this? There have been studies done on this, and it shows that they perform pretty well in regards to corruption robustness, and that SWIN models still have a shape bias far lower than VIT, right? So VITs have a quite a high shape bias, which we're very glad for, right? We want to prioritize shape over texture, but SWIN models have a lower shape bias than vision transformers, right? So that could be something that we've introduced by shifting windows, which isn't super ideal. However, they don't fall prey to the issues that CNNs do, like being weak against adversarial, oh, that should be against, against adversarial attacks. So are we getting closer and closer to the Goldilocks of the shape texture bias, right? We want something that is able to identify changes in shape and able to identify changes in texture, much like human eyes, but we want kind of a model in the middle. We don't want something like a CNN where it's so far towards the texture side that by by just laying over another texture on top of an image and it'll misclassify. But at the same time, we want something that doesn't have the same problems as vision transformers and that we don't want like high computation costs as well as not being able to classify certain subsets of an image. The beauty of transformers is in their genericness. They can capture patterns accurately no matter the data type 
or domain or use case, right? It's the same transformer architecture, whether you're using this for vision applications or like NLP applications, right? These can these are basically looking at patterns no matter what the data is because of the kind of self-attention calculations. More data results in more performance, right? We've talked about this earlier. Transformers are good if you have a ton of data. And VIT showed cl uh, clearly visible improvements up to 64 layers. So as you scale the model, you're improving performance, right? Which is what we expect for transformers. Lastly, SQUIN is scalable, right? It has linear time complexity, M by N time complexity, as you have an N and then an N that is uh, kind of changing. Uh, as you scale the size of your image. Um, Reattention and other techniques can help transformers get even better if you know we calculate attention once, but we can recalculate attention on the same parts. Um, but yeah, we talked about this. This is like our very first example uh, last week where we're trying to do like a, a French to English translation using a transformer model. Andre Karpathy, who's the former head of AI at Tesla, um, also kind of cites this paper as, as very cool. Uh, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of really cool things happening in this field. Food for thought. Specialization is for insects. This is a, a quote by an author that I forgot. Uh, but essentially, what are the benefits and drawbacks of having a model that can take in any kind of data, process it, and pull out patterns, right? Is generalizability the future of AI, kind of like a general AI that is able to, a, a black box model where I can pass in whatever and ask it for whatever, and it'll be able to synthesize these patterns accordingly, right? I can ask humans a whole bunch of questions, right? Is this chair the same color as this chair? I can ask, like, if you're bilingual, like, what does this mean in this language, right? Can we create a model that models the human brain by being able to have one model that can do a whole bunch of things depending on the input and the output that you want, right? Um, is Goldilocks not what we want if we want task precision? For self-driving cars, do we want a really robust like Goldilocks model? Is a self-driving car going to need to like, you know, do these translations, right? A whole bunch of considerations that we want to make. Overall, the field of adversarial robustness is still developing. Just shape and texture aren't enough features to prove invariance to certain attacks. So, you know, some other kind of future stages can be testing SWIN against Carlini Wagner or more advanced adversarial attacks. Um, that's basically it. That is all of it. <laughs> um, but thank you guys for coming. Um, hope you learned something new. Uh, these slides and this recording will be posted. Um, yeah, thank you guys for coming.